Hey guys, we have a $100 AFCO gift card and four LK lures rigged with beast hooks to give away. All you have to do is fill out a short survey and enter your email address in the box below. The link is located on Instagram and at the podcast description. Giveaway ends July 11th. Oh, my birthday, bro. <clears throat> and thanks again for all the support. We really appreciate it. Check out LK Lures on Instagram. They make amazing weedless baits. And check out AFCO. Uh, big supporter, Matt Florentino. Really appreciate it, bro. Later. Welcome to Cast and Crank Podcast. Today we have Dave Hansen. Your saltwater guy. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Dave. Uh, Dave's a, a guy I kind of knew about earlier from looking on Bloody Decks. Everyone's looking on Bloody Decks and I seen he was a guy, this is years ago when I kind of started getting into saltwater and I, I knew your name from that and I mean the more I've uh, been fishing, people suggest you like Jimmy Decker, you know, Billy Kay said, uh, oh, yeah. you know, and said you're a fun guy. So thanks. Yeah, I try. <laughs> try to make it exciting. Yeah. When you're out fishing. So let's talk about how it all started when you were a kid. All right. Well, I've been blessed to grow up as a Hanson. My father's been in the business since 1947. Wow. He's one of the pioneers of that are left. I mean, sport fishing was going on long before my father got involved, but what he started doing was meeting the boats when they would come in off the San Clemente Pier when he was 12 years old mm -hmm. with his wagon with a couple of his buddies, and they would cart your fish off the end of the pier oh. in their wagons for <laughs> 20 cents a wagon load. And he that's how he started in the business. And then the guys saw him all the time, and then they asked him to come out on the boats, and then he started working on the boats in 47, wow. and then that turned into working at San Clemente Sport Fishing. Then he bought San Clemente Sport Fishing. Oh, in wow. The, in the early 50s or late 50s and then here we are today at dana point wow. dana war sport fishing my father has nine sport fishing boats or eight sport fishing boats something like that he's been in the business forever and wow. i was lucky enough to grow up on the san clemente pier going out fishing with my dad i remember the first trip when i was three years old my mom oh, putting man. putting my shoes on in 1964 and telling me that we were going to go see dad on the boat and I didn't know, you know, three years old. Yeah. I don't know, but here we go. <laughs> and I remember falling in the bait tank when I was three years old oh. with my dad standing on the bait tank of the sum fun. And I fell in head first and he pulls me out by my leg and we go right back to chumming on the bait tank with the old man. <laughs> then I was just grew up on the pier going out with my dad every morning. The yeah. thing that used to make me really angry, Nick, was when I'd wake up in the morning uh -huh. and... The sun was coming out and I was still at home. I would be pissed because <laughs> the old man left me because yeah. he promised me the night before, go to bed early and you're going with me on the boat today. And then I'd get up and the sun was out. Oh, you gone. don't even understand how pissed I was. <laughs> I was so angry. And I was like, what, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. And all I wanted to do was go fishing. Yeah. And I'm 57 years old. And wow. what I do right now is on my day off, I go fishing yeah. and I work every day on the water and I'm blessed. So we kind of go slow here because there's so much information from doing it for so long. But yeah, I have I, a lot of questions too because you got to see different phases of fishing. You got to the cycles. You got to see when I started. Uh, the MLPA was started a year after when I got into okay. surf. So I was fishing in Laguna still. Yeah, and I love Laguna the greatest fishing place from on the, the shore. Planet. Yeah. So you got to fish that for All a while. The time. Yeah, when I ran the half day and three quarter day yeah. boats i would go to laguna all the time my fan or my clients would be stoked because we turn right where most boats out of day and a point go south i would always go north because there's so much to do in laguna yes it's sad we've lost that fishery and we've lost it forever yeah. it'll never ever come back when i was in the mlpa meetings which i went to almost every one of them mm -hmm. they told us they were going to revisit it five years later and so I went to the revisitation meeting. What was that? Two years ago. Two, okay. We had it. And I'm very vocal and I don't, I'm not hiding the ball and I'm the most politically incorrect human being on the planet. <laughs> you know, 
And I asked the question. I just stood up in the middle of the meeting because I don't believe in all the rigmarole. So mm -hmm. they don't really want me going to the meetings. I just stood up <laughs> in the middle of the meeting and said, if you look back here, there's a lot of people that make a living fishing. The reason we're all here is to find out when you're going to open it again. Mm -hmm. And we were told they will never open it again because it was never about fish. It was about structure. And as long as the structure is still there, it'll always be closed. So they're not going to open it again, yeah. no matter what kind of baloney they keep feeding us that they're going to look at it again. Yeah. They're never, it's gone. And it's sad because that fishery, like you said, Laguna oh, Beach God. was insane. I and, remember going to Crescent Bay, right? That's right. Below Crystal Cove. Right. And surf fishing and learning how to catch halibut from the surf so i was into halibut this is 2009 okay and, you know i remember walking and just seeing halibut run run from the from and i'm like <laughs> i'm like oh my i've never seen anything like that and i just found it so we would go to the ro the rocks were so good everything there oh was yeah so good you'd see just so insane. much life yeah and the closer you could get on a boat to fish on the beach like that yeah, yeah i would anchor 65 foot seahorse i would anchor it up in 20 feet of water wow. and the bass fishing was just Amazing absolutely that. insane yeah. and with all that going on then you get a few yellows you get a nice big sea bass it's all a big cycle would just start rolling along when you start yeah. chumming and all we ever had for bait back in the day was anchovies okay we never had sardines i didn't even know i'm sorry we're jumping all around <laughs> that's fine we're just it's a conversation in uh <laughs> back in the 60s and 70s when i first started fishing all the way up until the 90s, we had anchovies for bait. Okay. That's all we had. And if you wanted big bait, you jiggled up some mackerel before you went out in the morning or you took your passengers and you stopped at wherever the mackerel were and you jiggled up a bunch of mackerel so some guys would have bigger bait to fish with. Okay. But basically all we ever had was anchovies. And I remember in the 90s or probably the late 80s, there was a anchovy swimming around the bait tank. You'd see the circle they're going around and around circles and then there's this one fish in there that i didn't even know what it was yeah and i scooped it out of the bait tank and i brought it up to my buddy who was an old timer and i go hey what is this and he goes oh that's one of those sardines they're almost extinct and i was oh my like gosh what are you talking about <laughs> they're almost extinct and he goes yeah here's what they were led to believe back in the 80s that the canneries in Monterey had fished those things to extinction, wow. and there were no sardines left. Well, look, <laughs> let's set the clock up ahead 15 years. Yeah. Every bait barge up and down the coast is full of sardines. You yeah. can't drive 100 yards without finding a school of sardines in the ocean right, right now. And now they're right back to telling us that they're almost extinct. They tried to close the sardine fishery on us here a few months ago. Wow. And. It's all cycles. It all yeah. comes and it goes. Right and now, you see it. Yeah, you've seen it come and go. I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. A long you know? time. A and your dad time. too. So it's like you've heard stories from him, probably like, you know, just growing up. I'm sure, man. Well, in the mid '50s, he tells the story. He was running our no, excuse me, 1961 when they built the Sum Fund. He was running double half day. Mm -hmm. And they were settling. Now, this is the good old days, right? <laughs> they were settling the jackpot every day with a tomcod. Gosh. There was nothing to catch. The yeah. kelp bed started in Mexico and went all the way to Point Conception with no break in the kelp. Wow. And you couldn't catch a bass as big as your tallywhacker. Wow. There was nothing. That's and it, wild. Were they all gone? No, they weren't all gone. <laughs> it cycled. We had cold water. Back then, they didn't have a temperature gauge. Yes. They had a pool thermometer mm -hmm. that usually broke off, and it was laying in the bottom of the tank, and you didn't know <laughs> what the temperature was in the water. But yeah. there was cold water cycle time. And yeah. as we know, when the cold water comes, the fish kind of hunker down in their holes, and they don't come out to play, and yeah. fishing gets real slow. And But every, nowadays, with the microwave culture that we have, mm -hmm. If something doesn't happen like it did yesterday, it's a mad panic. Yeah. And all they say is close it, close it. <laughs> we got to close this. We got to close that. It's over. There's nothing left. Yeah. If you wait an hour, it'll come back. Mm -hmm. I say I do 50 plus seminars a year. Uh -huh. And I'm also on that. Let's talk hook up every Sunday morning. And yeah. what I try to tell everybody all the time is if you re re remember, I'm 57, but when we were children, in the 60s, they told us that we were all going to freeze to death because there was a hole in the ozone layer mm -hmm. that our moms made with their hairspray. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then about an hour after that, they told us we were out of gasoline on the whole planet. There was no gasoline yeah. left anywhere. Yeah. And now we set the clock 45 years ahead. And now they tell us we're going to burn to death. <laughs> and that there's more gasoline than our children's children's children could ever use. Yeah. It's the same rock. Yeah. We're still standing on the same rock. Yep. It's just different things come about. Like you said, I cycles. think it's yeah. all about control. <laughs> I think they're trying to control us. <laughs> it's okay. Go outside. Yeah. We have bluefin fishing like we've never seen before right yes, now. Yes. Yes. And if you look five years ago, they told us the bluefin were extinct. <laughs> they didn't want us to take any. The, yeah. the take was zero. And wow. Right now there's three quarter day boat out of San or five to five boat out of San Diego. The San Diego, they're catching fish, That's 100 crazy. pound fish. Yeah. And 150 <laughs> pound fish. And this is a fish that was supposed to be extinct. It's yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. It's pretty wild, but everybody needs to relax. And it's going to be okay. <laughs> Go outside. Look, the sun's out yep. today. Yes, it is. Three days ago, it was overcast. Very. Remember? And yeah. it had been overcast for like four months. Yeah. It was the end of the world. <laughs> And all of a sudden the sun's back and out And we got again. a heat wave coming too. Isn't so that, that yeah, weird? Yeah, it is. It's so weird. <laughs> so what they said was it was global warming. Uh -huh. Then it got cold. So what did they change the name to? Climate change. <laughs> I mean, come yeah, on. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Let's just relax, everybody. Yeah. The water's going to get warm. The water's going to get cold. Cycles. It's all going to come and it's all going to go. When yeah. we were kids fishing in Dana Point or San Clemente, mm -hmm. it was all about barracuda. Everybody loved barracuda. I love and, barracuda still. I love catching them. They're fun. And they're good to eat if you prepare them proper. Really? I mean, those guys, a lot of the old timers that I talked to in interview, they made their fishing, go to go fishing money off of selling barracuda. Wow. Everybody wanted barracuda. Everybody bought barracuda. Uh -huh. They ate it smoked. They ate it. Now when the barracuda come, everyone's like, ah, oh, barracuda. <laughs> Slime oh, stick. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't want another barracuda. It's kind of weird. It's yeah. very strange. It's just fun to go out and catch a fish. Right. That's right? how I am. I'm the same exact way. I don't mind catching them. I went out with uh, Benny Florentino. We were catching okay. barracuda. And I'm like, I don't care. This is fun for me still. I mean, they're killing the bait, you know, but it's still fun for me. Like, Oh, I, I absolutely. Mean, they I just fight love, hard. Yeah. It's yeah. a heck of a bite when yeah. they bite the lure. Yep. I mean, I love fishing them on the iron. <laughs> yeah. When they're biting the iron, there's yeah. nothing more fun than that. And most of the time, you're an hour from your house catching barracuda. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you yeah. didn't have to go on a two-day trip to drive in the middle of the ocean to hopefully get a bite. Yep. It's every it's fun. cast. Right. Yeah. It's a blast. And sometimes I'm sure you have to find the fish and just put your clients on fish, right? Correct. And you, you just put whatever you can get if it's a hard bite, right? Oh, yeah. People yeah. ask all the time, what are we going to fish for today? I said, whatever bites our hook. <laughs> We're hoping that we get some fish. We're do just you hoping do, we get a you bite. Do you do lures to end? You do everything? Yeah. Basically, I'm a bait guy. Okay. And the boat I run in Dana Point's a 65-foot Hatteras called the wild and sack and we have a bait tank that holds about 15 to 20 scoops of bait on the boat okay it's, it's got the biggest bait capacity of any six-pack charter boat wow, on the coast gosh. i believe and uh we have we have i'm sponsored by a bunch of different companies so we have all the lures we have everything flat falls mm -hmm. every kind of lure you could imagine we have on the boat if that's what you want to do yeah but we're bait guys. Okay. We fish bait. We have plenty of bait. We yeah. always have bait available. If they're biting mackerel, me and my crew will go out and get you a bunch of mackerel before you get there in the morning. Yeah. So you got mackerel for bait. But nice. We have the best bait company on the coast fishing for Dana Point Harbor. So we got yeah. plenty of bitch and bait in Dana Point with like 20 some boxes of bait. So the bait's pretty darn good in <laughs> Dana Point. So we're pretty lucky there. Yeah, definitely. So you do, do you go wherever, or do you like to stay in this general area of like Dana Point, San Clemente, or you'll charter wherever you Well, you here's go. the thing. Like I was telling, we, we're jumping all over the place. But and we can, it's fine. That's it's, okay, it's, cool. it's, We'll come back to stuff. So and, what I did was I ran sport boats for the family. Uh -huh. I worked on sport boats. I worked in San Diego back in the 80s, fishing albacore, yellowfin tuna, bluefin, all that stuff, and. Then went back to the family business and was running double half day and twilight trips and doing all the things that you do in the sport boat industry. And then my father and I had a little 
for it's hard to work for your family. Let's be honest. Uh, very true. <laughs> and when you work with your dad every single day, there's liable to be some problems. And I love my father, and we have the f- finest relationship. I mean, I just talked to him right before I walked in here. Mm-hmm. We talk every day a lot. We go to Angels games all the time. We have a great relationship. It's way better than it was in the 80s and 90s when we worked together every day. (laughs) So in the 90s, we had a little falling out, fell apart. And so I started your saltwater guide business back in 94. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which no one had ever heard of anything like it. I go with you on your boat Uh and I teach you how to fish on your boat. Pretty mind-boggling, pretty cutting edge. Yeah. Because there really wasn't a lot of private boats back then like there is now. But there was the private boats. And what we used to see is the private boaters would follow the sport boats around. Mm -hmm. And we used to always have a bunch of negative things to say about the private boater that followed us around. But then I had an epiphany one day. I'm like, you know why they're... First of all, you can't be (laughs) dumb and own a boat. You have to have... You have to be pretty successful in whatever you're doing to be able to purchase a boat. Yeah. Because that's a big commitment for Mm -hmm. anybody. And I'm like, you know what? They're not dumb. They just have X amount of time available to go fishing. And what's the easiest way to figure out where the fish are? Follow the party boat. Mm -hmm. Because you know he's going to find fish. So that's what they do is they... And I don't want to beat up on them. That's what they do until they have a chance to be educated. So that's why I started your saltwater guide service back in the early nineties mm-hmm. was to teach guys that you don't have to follow boats. You don't have to be on that guy's stern. And it makes it a little more comfortable to have you on their boat because you're next time you go out, you could use this information to feel comfortable, right? On your boat. Correct. What you showed them. That's I like that. That's kind of cool. You know, well, it gives you plus, even if you know how to, let's just say, you know, mm-hmm. You're a pretty good fisherman. You're pretty adept at what you're doing, but you want someone to tell you that's in the, not that I'm the greatest fisherman in the world, but someone that's been doing it for a long time. If he can get on your boat and tell you, yeah, what you're looking at on your fish finder is yellowtail yeah. or what you're doing, how you're anchoring is the right way. Mm-hmm. Or if you're just doing a couple things, not perfect, mm-hmm. it's good to have that person there. And that's why I believe I've been so successful is because I can set like I'm doing with you right now. Yeah. Every day with a different human being that I've never met before in my life. Three years ago, I was on 147 different boats in one year. Wow. Meet so many people. Because huh? I'm the only guy that does what I do. I yeah. mean, people say they they go with you on your boats, mm-hmm. but they really don't. <laughs> because when it comes down to that day, I've had, and I've yeah. begged people to help me in my industry. Yeah. I need some more guides. I need some more guys to help me because there's so many clients out there. Mm hmm. And no one, I don't know why, but no one wants to go with you on your boat and help you. Yeah. They just don't. So I, and you got to have knowledge. Mm -hmm. One day I'm in San Diego fishing with some guys on their uh, 26 foot Parker. And the next day I'm at the Channel Islands fishing with a guy on his 44 Pacifica. Yeah. Then the next day I'm over at San Clemente Island fishing with a guy on his Viking. Mm -hmm. Then the next day I'm out of Dana Point fishing with a guy on his Boston Whaler. Yeah. But if you don't have knowledge, it's kind of hard yeah. out there to go try to figure it out. So I've been blessed with the fact that my dad's been in the business for so long. We ha- we're so connected with all the party boats up and down the coast and all the captains. A lot a lot of the guys that have been in the business for 30 plus years have either worked for my family or they know my dad really well. Or work next to them. Right. You know, for So we can reach out and say, hey, I'm coming up to the Channel Islands today, Frank. What? What's going on up here? You Where should I be? You have your network Correct. of people. Yeah. Yeah. And like I talked to my dad, I just did a interview on my website with my father and his code group back in the day were some big names in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, Bill Poole was his San Diego code group guy. Jimmy Schaefer was his Newport guy and Whitey Ashley. And those guys talked in the morning on the telephone mm-hmm. back then. In the 40s and 50s, and yeah. then they got a plan. What's the water like in Oceanside? Because Bill Poole was working on the bi- on the fishing barge down there, mm-hmm. and Bill Poole was like big time. Mm-hmm. And then Whitey Ashley was big time Pierpoint Landing, and then my dad at Dana Wharf Sport Fishing, and Jimmy Schaefer at Newport, Davies Locker. So wow. that was his network of guys back in the day. And so I'm blessed that I have a cool network of guys that I can call, and they'll actually talk to me. Yeah. And there's people... 
as we talked about before, that don't like Dave Hansen. <laughs> it's kind of weird because I'm ruining fishing. <laughs> I'm ruining fishing, which is kind of silly. Yeah. And I talk to Billy all the time, too, because he's getting to the level of hatred that I have been at since the 90s. You know, and I keep telling him, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Don't let these people affect you. Because the level of hate is mind-boggling in this industry because the last thing anybody wants to see anybody do is succeed. Uh huh. It's really weird. Uh -huh. <laughs> and what Billy and I do is we're helping the industry like you can't even comprehend because of the fact that we're helping educate. Now, if you, I'm jumping all over, but look, at, mm -hmm. if you want to learn how to play the guitar, what do you do? YouTube. You know, you hire a musician <laughs> well, to see, teach you. I, I'm self-taught, so I, okay. I, 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 uh, I just picked it up and listened. Well, good. So, but, 99, but, but fishing's a different story. But 99.9% .9 of the people will get lessons. Will get lessons. Yes. Yeah. If you want to learn how to fly a plane, you don't learn on YouTube. <laughs> Sorry. You hire, hire a pilot and yeah. he teaches you. You want to learn how to play golf? You hire a golf pro. Yeah. Okay. If you want to learn how to fish, here's the biggest message that people ha say on the internet. Mm -hmm. Figure it out like we had to. Really? It's such a <laughs> negative con you're, you're condescending the new fishermen. Uh -huh. We're missing out on the new guys. Okay. We're, you, a lot of the tackle stores you go into, they treat the people wrong. The new people are the blood. That is it. If you don't have the new people coming in, if you don't treat them right, and they get that negative feeling that you get, they're leaving. They're not. They're and, like fishing sucks. And I, don't I think the fish. new the new thing too is that's why I try to say tackle shops when when uh we do the end of the interview I go what tackle shop do you use because I feel like it's so easy to go on tackle warehouse or go online order whatever you need and not go into the tackle shop and buy it and then you don't get to meet some of these cool people right like that's how I performance I go to performance all the time because I met Mark and okay. Joe and I talk to them all the time nice guys. I even went in there before when I, I even had the podcast and Mark gave me directions. I was struggling. I'm like, hey, how do you fish the kelp? You know, I like using lures. He's like, try this, this, and this. I came back. I'm like, man, awesome. You know, and, and it's with the newer generation, I feel like, yeah, it's, it's easy to go on social media and kind of shit on people. Right. <laughs> you know? Oh, it's and, amazing and it's, in this uh, industry. And I, I like going to the tackle shop. That's like I try to, if I could promote something myself would be try to go to the tackle shop and buy stuff if you can right. you know and there is the good tackle stores and there's yeah. the bad tackle stores and <laughs> you guys know who you are and i'm not here to beat anybody yeah, up but yeah. we need to lose the negative con condescending way that we treat the new angler mm -hmm. the new angler is our blood and we need those people and that's what i've done my whole life is try to teach people and it's okay to educate people on the right way and the wrong way to fish. And yeah. people don't have time, especially nowadays with the the amount of money it costs to live in Southern California. Yeah. We're out chasing that almighty dollar all day. You're right. And then the one day we get to go fishing on our boat, we want to be successful. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've been doing what I've been doing since the 90s. Whether people like the people that don't like me, they've never, ever met me. Mm -hmm. Never. They don't know me. They they know me from Bloody Decks, 976 Tuna, <laughs> but they don't know me. They've never sat down and had a yeah. cup of coffee with me. Same with Billy. I mean, you've been, you oh, know well, Billy. Yeah. Well, the thing nicest is, nicest man is, in the world. Is I, I don't judge anyone until I meet them. I hear stuff about everyone, but I go, hey, I don't know you. You don't know me. Let's talk. Right. And this is how I get to meet people. And I go, hey, well, who do you think of this person? I'm like, dude, he seems like a cool dude to me. He might do some stuff that people don't approve of, but hey, as long as you're not hurting anyone, dude, I mean, you know, right? It's it's if you don't like something, I always said, just don't buy it. You know, like right. don't don't get don't buy it. There's plenty of stuff I don't like. I don't buy. You know, like even with fishing gear, or you know, people like I just you just don't deal with them. You just don't Correct. deal with things. And I think it's easy. To go on the internet and just shit oh, on and bash <laughs> us. They love to bash anything. And I'm I not say. saying that I've never not done that. I mean, <laughs> everyone's done it, dude. Everyone's said some bullshit on the internet, but you have seen it for years now oh, since you're boy. the first guy, right? I was. We made Donnie <laughs> Brockman and I and uh, Joe Barian and Danny Jackson from uh, Angler Chronicles, yes. and he used to work with Ronnie Kovacs before all that stuff. Danny Jackson videographer went with Donnie Brockman and I, and we made a library of videos of the spots. 
okay. 30 years ago. Wow. Okay? Yeah. And it was VHS back then. And uh, holy moly, you want to talk about some hatred. So you had a VHS tape out with the spots. Still do. Right and now, you it's could on go a... see where to fish. Do you from, have it like laid out like a video? From, like From Santa Monica Bay to Cabo San Lucas. Oh, man. But see, I've redone all this on my website. How how much shit did you get for the VHS? A ton. Yeah. A ton. Yeah. A ton. <laughs> Just a ton. But it was... And you know, there's guys <laughs> that say, oh, you're a sellout, Hanson. Well, Don Brockman owns Davy's Locker, or part of. Yeah. He owns the freelance. Okay? He employs a lot of people mm -hmm. that are out there yelling that I'm a sellout. Well, your boss is too, because he was standing <laughs> right next to me when we made these videos. But you have no problem working for him. But you want to call me out all the time. It's yeah. pretty funny. These spots, they're in books now. They're on, they're on charts. They're, you could buy you, you could buy the maps now, right? You could uh, are they on those maps you can buy yeah, from the stores? So. Yeah, but all that stuff is available to everybody today. Yeah. We were just ahead of the curve 30 years ago, so right away I ruined fishing in Southern California. <laughs> Single-handedly, we ruined fishing in Southern yeah. California. So what I've done with my website, Your Saltwater Guide, is I've re-digitalized all this. The spots are still there. They didn't move. Yeah. Now we even talk to you more in depth because of the understanding now about the GPS and mm -hmm. how all that works. So what I've done is I put together this library we start in right now. We're only up to uh, the horseshoe. Okay. But we cover all of Catalina. We cover all of San Clemente Island. We cover from the horseshoe kelp down to uh, Oceanside. Okay. And we give you Orange County. We give you Catalina. We give you San Clemente Island. And I each spot, I give a little narrative of okay, if you're here, let's just use White Rock at San Clemente Island for example. Mm -hmm. You're here at White Rock. There's two spots. There's the uphill current side and the downhill current side. You want to anchor in 90 feet of water because the bull kelp here mm -hmm. is growing up. And if you do get into that, if that yellow starts to bite, you could get bit in shallower in 60, 70 feet of water, but every fish is going to make it to the bull kelp. So you park outside in the 90 foot of water. You sh I teach you how to chum, which is super important because mm -hmm. if you're just throwing bait off the back of the boat and the currents flowing off the back of the boat you're chumming for a boat moving a mile high. away you want to throw the bait as far off the bow but all this is covered on my website and so we teach you on each spot how to how to fish it uphill current downhill current southeast wind northeast wind stuff like that which no one's ever done for anybody mm -hmm. you know like you take that chart like we were just talking about and yeah. look at it it has some numbers on there but really to the average human being that has a real job not a fishing job <laughs> that doesn't make any sense yeah it takes a little work to find i mean i'm a noob still so it's kind of like when i pull up to like something on my navionics guide i'll be right. like okay what am i looking for how am i kind of looking and am i pulling off too much off that rock or whatever am i not back on it you know and i'm dropping lures on it but i mean it's and it's the wind a, has yeah. a huge exactly and then the current yeah and all that stuff and i teach you that you got to anchor because we're not fishing plastics. We're mm -hmm. fishing bait. We're trying to get the fish to react to the chum and then start to bite. And if you're drifting over these spots, you have you shouldn't even chum, first of all. Yeah. Because if you're chumming and drifting, you're you're never gonna be where your chum is. So I teach how to anchor and do all that stuff mm -hmm. with the with the wind and everything, because every single day is totally different. Yeah. Yeah. So this is something that no one else has done for anybody. Mm -hmm. And I've taken it to the the highest level so that my clients can be successful when they go out fishing, yeah. which I don't understand why that is such a bad thing, but boy, there are some people that think <laughs> I'm the worst person on the planet. And every single video right now, there's over 180 videos available on my website. Oh, wow. That's a lot. And I add new videos every week, brand new videos cut of stuff that pertains to what we're doing in Southern California. Do you do, you do stuff with other anglers too? Like oh, yeah. friends of yours you'll have come on and kind of do a video? We have a full Legends series on there. Oh. We have 32 videos on there of just the legends of fishing in Southern California. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's a ton of 25-year-old legends right now out there. I understand <laughs> that. I saw them at the Fred Hall show. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm talking true legends. 25 year old. There legends. are. Oh my gosh. Come on. You know who they are, and so do I. And we can name them right now. They're full legends because they caught a 25 pound bluefin last year. <laughs> but uh, 
Oh, man. I'm talking about real legends. Uh-huh. Guys that have been doing this for a living for 40 plus, 50, 60, 70 years, 80-year-old men, 90-year-old wow. men yeah. that, are, that are on there talking about what it was like in the old days, what it's like now, and what the middle was like, and how they got the passion. Yeah. And so you get all that, and then... You got all the technical stuff too, you know, the chum in, the how to check your oil, how to work your GPS, how to work your radar, how to everything that you could possibly imagine. And every day I think of something new mm-hmm. that I think you guys should know. So I put it on there and I only charge $4 and 99 cents a month. It's a good deal. <laughs> I mean, like I said with Billy too, it costs something... more than that for your gas. Yeah. For and a it, gallon. <laughs> yeah, right. If you use a 91. <laughs> Which is super interesting. The legend thing, that's like really interesting to me. I'd, I'd be like, just to watch those videos of some dudes that have been doing it for a long time and saw many different phases of this. Oh, know? yeah. It's insane yeah. to hear the stories. And to get there and get like you get to do sitting here. Just to yeah, get the no, guy that, in front of us to talk to yeah. us and tell us. Because you could read this stuff. All over the place, but yeah. you get the guy in front of you, and you get to see him in the video, and he's all excited. And here's a 75 or 80 year old man that's excited about the passion of fishing. Fishing, yeah, man, that's pretty insane. And then you go, oh, how long you been doing it? 70 years. You're like, and you're still this excited? <laughs> wow, yeah, that's so cool. And every single one of these legends that I talk to, you know what their very favorite fish to catch is? What is that? Calico bass. That's like me. <laughs> Every, you know, because calico bass fishing is so fun. Yes. You're usually at a beautiful spot and you're anchored up and the scenery is great. Uh-huh. And the thrill of catching a five pound calico is just insane. I love cal- I love sand bass <laughs> fishing, calico bass fishing. Like I always say, every time on this thing, I'm, this year I'm I'm shooting for a yellowtail. I haven't caught a yellowtail yet. So. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's the next thing I'm shooting for this this next couple months. So, and there's some big schools around, so yeah. you probably got a pretty good chance of getting a yellow this year. Yeah, I'll probably just go out on a charter or something, you know, because right. I have my own boat. But I know, I saw it in the driveway. Yeah, that's that's my wall. I go to the wall all the time. But all right, uh, yeah, I think that's interesting. I think the website's interesting too. I mean, it's. It could help someone, you know, if they want to use it. And, and like you said, it cuts down on some time for people. It takes the curve out yeah. for everybody. And I don't care if you've been doing it for 30 years or you've been doing it for 10 minutes. Yeah. There's something in there for everybody. Yeah. You would be shocked that all the... See, here's what most people don't understand. I know who's on my website. I see all their emails. <laughs> I know who they all are. There's... The the numbers <laughs> the numbers are extraordinary. You would yeah. fall over in your chair if you knew how many people were on there. But there's sport boat captains that are on there. Yeah. Because these spots are the spots. Yeah. These are the spots that I stole from all the old timers that I <laughs> fished with my whole life. You know, this is stuff that I've had in the book mm-hmm. that I had since I was a little kid. And I'm teaching people how to use them. And what I tell everybody on my website over and over and on the radio show on Sundays and on social media, stop fishing for boats. Yeah. That's the number one thing that everybody does wrong. You get over to Catalina or you get over to Clemente or you get out here. Let's just say the horseshoe, for example. Mm Mm-hmm. You and your buddy got a plan. You're going fishing. Let's say you're going to the wall. Yeah. Let's just say you're going to the wall. Yeah. And you're coming out. All of a sudden, you look to the left, and here's 12 boats. <laughs> and your buddy starts jerking on the back of your shirt going, hey, let's. what are those guys doing over there? What are those guys doing over there? We should go over there and see what they're doing. No. Next thing you know, you're off. I know, not you, but 99.9% of the people are like, we better go look. Yeah. And off you go. And you go over there. And... Everybody's just sitting around with their poles straight. <laughs> no one's rods bent. They're all sitting around looking at each other. Yeah. And you're like, what is going on here? One day I stopped to take a piss on the big Hatteras. I stopped, came down the ladder, took a piss. And by the time I got done peeing in the bathroom, came upstairs, there was five boats <laughs> sitting around us. What do you take as, so this is another etiquette. <laughs> Etiquette. I like talking yeah. about etiquette. And there's a whole what section you, on my website. What do you think is for etiquette for boat distance between boats? So say I roll up to a spot. I was planning on going and there's a boat there. How far do you usually give someone etiquette-wise? Well, if they're anchored up there, mm-hmm. you got to go somewhere else. Okay. 
because that they got there first. What if they're just drifting? Then you just wait because they're going to drift off the spot. As soon as they drift off, I drop my anchor right on it. Really? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Because that's not my fault that they don't know how well, to drop well, what their if, anchor. What if you're dropped on anchor how far away? Say it's like Isers or something where there's okay. a decent amount of you know, structure there. Right. How far off would you? Well, would you never you... get behind. Okay. Never, ever get behind another boat, mm-hmm. ever. First of all, you're not going to be anywhere near any fish. Because if you've ever seen fish, they swim up current. Mm-hmm. So if you got, if you absolutely have to fish where the other boat is, you want to be on his bow. Okay, always because all they're chumming, they got their baits in the water, everything's starting to happen. Mm-hmm. All those fish are swimming up current. Okay, if you park behind them, like everybody wants to park behind them. Yeah. Well, you're in left field. Yeah. All the fish are swimming up swell. If you ever watch sport boats, let's say back, let's. You probably never seen the sand bass bike, but no, not back like, in the day, yeah. there used to be sand bass on the Huntington Flats and the yes. clam beds and stuff when that stuff cycled in here. And we would dip, literally park on each other's bows. You would bow the other boat. So let's say the freelance is there getting bit real good. I'd mm-hmm. pull up on the seahorse. I would get a couple hundred yards off his bow. Then I'd drop my anchor and scope back. Now we become a 200 foot long boat. Mm hmm. And then the next boat would come, the Enterprise, and Annie would get up on my bow. And so the three of us would be in line. And those sand bass are swimming upstream, and the yellows and the barracuda, and now everybody's getting bit. But what private boaters try to do is get behind you. First of all, if you're up on the guy's bow, no one on the boat sees you. Yeah, they don't yeah, see you. Yeah. So you're like stealth. You're hiding up there on the bow. <laughs> they don't see you. If you go behind them, Everybody on the boat's losing their mind. Yeah. They're screaming, yelling, throwing stuff at you, <laughs> right? I've heard losing their mind. <laughs> and you're not you're in left field. You're not going to catch anything. All you're yeah. going to do is cause havoc. Yeah. You want to approach every boat always by the bow. Another thing is when you're offshore tuna fishing. Mm-hmm. This is something that most people don't understand. Every single boat drifts stern first. Mm-hmm. When you're out tuna fishing, when you're setting on a drift catching yellowfin or albacore or bluefin or whatever it is, the boat's drifting, guys chumming, you're always going to chum on the farthest downhill side co- corner of the boat because the boat's drifting backwards. Mm-hmm. And when the wind's blowing on the starboard side, the boat's actually drifting to the port corner, st- stern first. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm sure, I don't know, you've been tuna fishing before. The no, fish start boiling. No, okay. I, so you're explaining something to me. Fish like, start okay. boiling on the okay. bow. People see them boiling on the bow all the time. That's because the boat's drifting backwards. Okay. Every single boat. Royal Polaris to your Ranger. Okay. They all drift backwards. That's just the way they were designed. Yeah. When the wind hits them, they drift backwards. You want to get on the bow. If you see a boat that looks like an umbrella out there, every mm-hmm. rod is bent. Mm-hmm. So we call it looking like an umbrella. Get on his bow. Yeah. Now you can start catching the fish he's catching. Most guys try to get up swell. Mm-hmm. That doesn't work. The boat's drifting backwards. So you're up swell. You're out of position. You want to try to get as close to the bow as you can with outside of casting range. If you're inside a cast, if you're inside a casting range, and not your casting range, because I don't know how you cast, yeah. but if you're inside Someone, of a guy that knows how to throw the iron, yeah. you're too close. Yeah. If you can have a conversation like we're having right now. <laughs> You're too close. And people get that close right. to you sometimes. Oh my gosh. They get on your boat sometimes. It's like, hey, do you want something to eat? But the bow is the place. At Catalina, at Clemente, if you go by a boat and you see them hooking yellows, mm-hmm. they're going to be anchored because that's how you catch yellows at the islands. Yeah. On the anchor, you can get up there and anchor off his bow. If you know how to drop your anchor, don't go practice dropping your anchor trying to get on a sport boat's bow. That's not going to be good. But if you can get on his bow, then you can become part of his chum line. All mm-hmm. those yellows are swimming up swell, and they're going to come transfer right to your boat. Yeah. We do it all the time. It works flawlessly. Bowing each other is insane. Yeah. And it works out really Very well. And you stay out yeah. of everyone's way. Okay? Does that make a little yeah. bit of sense, kind of? Yeah. That's how we all do it. And that's yeah. how I, first of all, I teach my guys on when I'm out guiding is just to stay away from the sport boat. Yeah. But Definitely. if you absolutely have to fish the sport boat, then fish on his bow. Hold on really quick. Sorry. Good to go again. Okay. <laughs> all right. Cool. So did we? No, oh, no. We're good. We to got go. it all? Yeah, we're recording. Yeah. Okay. Still, I just, I had it happen once before. What happens is 
I could cut this out. No, it, I it'll, gotcha. it'll, I need to run an internet line here. I have Wi-Fi. Okay. And the Pro Tools works off Wi-Fi. Gotcha. So then it drops. I think it did it with uh, Dwayne Diego's. Okay. And I had to wait, reload it, pull. I have the files there, but just as a bitch to get everything back on. All so right. I'd rather just stop real quick. Say, if you've got to piss, we can stop. you got to piss. Yeah, no, I'm cool. All right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Dwayne but, Diego. There you go. Yeah, he I, came on. <laughs> I took Dwayne for his first trip to Cabo. No way. On a 43 Michelson that I was running. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> this is a good story. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we leave San Diego. We're headed to Cabo. We're doing eight knots, cruising along. Mm -hmm. We get to Cedros. And Dwayne's a phenomenal fisherman. Just back then, he was just starting out in his career. Of, he was a deckhand. Mm -hmm. and he, but he was a phenomenal fisherman back then. Mm -hmm. This was 15, 12, wow. 13 years ago. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, dude, look at all the birds working. So we slid in there and it was all big 30 pound yellows and they were biting the iron like every cast. <laughs> and then, uh, so I let Dwayne drive the boat for a little while and I was fighting the fish and we were trying to get them. There was huge schools of sea lions eating our yellows. We were having a blast though, just him and I and the, my other deckhand. And then we left this wide open yellowtail bite cause we're, we're on our delivery. We're delivering that guy's boat to Cabo mm -hmm. and we get down the beach probably five miles and there's a couple of pelicans right on the sand on the beach and Dwayne's got his surface iron and he's on the bow and I drive right up in there and he cast his surface iron and he's going to listen to it. He's going to know exactly. He cast his surface iron and this yellow tail is probably 40 pounds Shit. was swimming in the sand and it just reacted to a surface iron and ate it right there. There was no structure in there. It was in oh, there chasing man. bait on the sand. And we got to watch the whole thing and Dwayne kicked its ass and we got it. <laughs> and it was pretty spectacular. And I know he remembers it like it was yesterday. What a great yeah, story, man. It that's was like, insane. From the sand, especially. That's uh, that's really cool. Pulled the Michaelson yeah. right in there. Dwayne <laughs> on the bow pulpit. And uh, so then we get about another 15 miles down the line and the boat stops running it. Uh-oh. This is a brand new Michelson. Wow. And it just stops. Uh-huh. So we get my buddy Todd Mantry, who's coming down on the boardroom. He tows us into Turtle Bay. Mm -hmm. and we get on the mooring can in Turtle Bay, and uh, we don't know what to do. Brand new boat with the new Zeus drives. Mm -hmm. There, No one knows how to work on them. We don't know nothing. We don't know what we're going to do. So we sat there for three or four days. I think it was four with nothing to do. So we had the guy, Ruben, who had the Annabelle's fuel back then. He takes us out fishing on his pongo one day. Because uh -huh. we're just bored out of our minds. We got oh, nothing I to bet. do and no one's coming to help <laughs> us. So Dwayne's like, well, I'm going to show you how to fish with the plastics. I'm like, cool. I'm all about learning. Yeah. We went out there and we just had a phenomenal day fishing with the plastics. Wow. And it was all like five, six pound calicos every cast. We just were having the time of our lives, caught a million bass. And then uh, the next day, one of my buddies shows up um, on a boat called the Predator. Mm -hmm. And he pulls up and he's like, Dave. And I'm all Todd. And he's all, <laughs> what are you doing? And I told him and he came over and he's like a part time electrician. He came on the boat. He took some of the electrical components apart on the computer scrubbed it with a toothbrush, put it back together. The boat started up <laughs> and off we went no and way. we're on our way to Cabo and we get about 120 miles South. Literally we're on the Ridge. It's as flat as this table. The uh -huh. water's a hundred foot visibility and there are giant schools of Marlin chasing oh giant God. squid. They're chasing the yeah. squid this big and these balls and <laughs> Dwayne's chucking the surface iron and the marlin are chasing surface iron and there's Dorado and yellows. Oh my gosh. And it's just the most. And then the boat stops <sighs> running again. again. Now we're stuck. Now it's kind of a little more scary. Right? In the middle of nowhere, <laughs> we are stuck. Yeah. And uh, never in my life have I ever called Mayday before. Oh, and really? I, you every, had to do it. Every 15 minutes. We are way down in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And so... About 11, we've been drifting now for like five hours. It's 11 o'clock at night, and I get out another call, Mayday, 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 and I hear, Hanson, is that you? 
And I was like, dun, da, da, da. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Who is this? And he goes, it's Greg to Stefano. And I'm like, where are you? He said, I'm in Santa Maria. Now, those of us that are listening that know Santa Maria, there's no way the radio signals going through this mountain at Santa Maria, mm -hmm. but it is because there's a higher power greater than all yeah. of us. That's... <laughs> that day, especially, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I tell him what's going on and he's like 70 miles from us. Wow. And he says, we're coming. And he drove all the way up there and he towed us all the way to Santa Maria. Wow. And that, that's a, that we could go on for an hour with that story, but he gets us into Santa Maria and we drop the anchor in 20 feet of water, let all the chain and rope our all the chain out. There's no rope. Mm hmm. And he dri he drives, we're all by ourselves in this yeah. giant bay, me and Dwayne and my other deckhand. Oh. And he leaves and we're like, okay, <laughs> now what do we do? <laughs> and the boat has no water. Yeah. We were supposed to be a five day trip. Oh. We're on to day like nine now. God. We have no fresh water. So yeah. we call these, this guy, Bob, that owns Mag Bay Outfitters and uh -huh. he brings us a bunch of cases of water. So we're like, okay, we got some water. He got us some food, but yeah. we're still stuck. Yeah. We can't go anywhere. Did you guys try the whole trick with the old connectors? Oh, yeah. Nothing we did everything. Huh? <laughs> Nothing's working. We were stuck for 14 days. Oh, my God. We were eating lobsters like they were out. Me and Dwayne. <laughs> okay? This is how... And I got real close with Dwayne Diego. Me and him, we were like stuck on this little boat. Talking about everything. Oh right? my God. We had five <laughs> videos, five DVDs back then. That's all we had. We watched the intakes, the outtakes, the outcuts, the director's cut. Every what, movie, what movies were they? I couldn't even remember. <laughs> I couldn't even remember. But I haven't had a drink in 30 something years. Mm -hmm. I've been clean and sober for 31 years. And uh, there was probably five or six bottles of wine and a bottle of vodka. And poor Dwayne and my deckhand, they drew. They drank everything the guy had on the boat because it was so flipping boring. There was yeah. nothing. No one got drunk. I mean, that was a spread out over six, yeah. 16 days. And then finally, these mechanics from uh, Michelson showed up. They flew down, landed on the beach in, uh, in uh, Lopez Mateo. My buddy Bob brought him out on a ponga. They got on the boat. They had the, the computer. They knew what was wrong. They put the new computer on. They said, do a lap around the bay to see if everything works. We did a wrap, lap around the bay, and I slingshot it out of the bay, and I took him to Cabo with me, the two mechanics. <laughs> we drove all night at 20 knots, got down to Cabo just in time, and we were in the Bisbees the next morning. Oh, no way. We were leaving a, We were leaving four, three weeks early to pre-fish. Okay. We ended up getting there just in time to fish that morning on the Bisbees, and oh. we fished the three-day Bisbees tournament, me and Dwayne. How did that go? We didn't catch a qualifier. We caught some fish, caught <laughs> yeah. some big wahoo and stuff. But yeah. it was it was fun, yeah, to be on the boat for sixteen days, stuck in the middle wow, of Baja. Man, <laughs> that is a great story. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, up. what's your uh, craziest boat story? I'm sure that's one of them. Yeah, me and Dwayne <laughs> hanging out, man. He tells that story all the time. So do I. It's a pretty amazing yeah. story. So that's how I got to know Dwayne Diego pretty well, <laughs> and we both lived through that. It was pretty insane. I bet. I bet something like that, you know, you, it's a crazy, crazy situation. Oh, yeah. You know? Look at where he's gone now. The guy is amazing, insane fisherman. The a guy nice, such great a, guy, too. Oh, great yeah. Guy. He's super down to earth. Really super nice yeah, guy. Definitely. Yep. He's done very well for himself. <laughs> yeah. It's good to see. I applaud everybody that does well for themselves in this industry mm -hmm. because it's such a... It's such a tough industry to make a living in. When you yeah. see someone that gets a niche and is able to make a living, you are very happy with them. And he turns a lot of people onto this. Mm -hmm. You know, he has a big following, big social media following. So that's what it's all about is showing people that there are fish out here. Yeah. And it's fun to catch them. Yeah. And you're not a criminal if you take a fish home and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> right exactly yeah, it's okay to kill a fish take it you home bet. and eat it if you're gonna, it's eat gonna it, be all no right. problem at all right that's right <laughs> or if you're not you can feed the sea lions they're exactly. starving to oh death. yeah although take right? it for you right <laughs> <laughs> exactly so yeah that have you been in pretty rough seas before i'm sure you have yeah i have a pretty wild story we were taking a <laughs> boat doing a delivery to seattle washington and we got caught in the middle of the night off of morro bay 
and the seas were like 18 to 20 foot. Oh my God. And the boat was not built to be in that water. <laughs> and we hit this gnarly wave in the middle of the night and it ripped the dinghy off the top of the boat and threw oh, it down through the swim step. Ended up up on the beach. The next wave knocked the radar dome off. The, and the eyes and glass got all ripped off. And so we were just taking full green water into our face all night long. Ended up getting into Monterey at like three in the morning and tying the boat up there and leaving it there for a couple of weeks while they fixed everything and then came back up on the train and took it the rest of the way to Seattle. But that was probably one of the scariest nights of my life. That was pretty gnarly. And it was all because wow. I misread the weather. It was back in the infant days of the internet and, I thought that it said uh, that it wasn't going to be small craft, but it was small craft. And we up there, you don't want to mess around with the weather. I it heard gets up there, it's, quick. It's, it's, everyone's got those big boats. They fish so, out. Yeah. And everything's about the captain. And I made a horrible judgment call and got caught yeah. in that gnarly How big weather. was the boat you were in? 57 foot. Yeah. But wow. we got caught and it was pretty sketchy. Yeah, it sounds like it. All night long, just <laughs> praying that we're going to make it with a big hole in the swim step from the dinghy going through it. And the dinghy ended up on the beach in Morro Bay. Wow. It was pretty insane. I mean, it was right out of uh, Perfect Storm That's type of thing. Yeah, it's like it was kind of like, like that. The movie, it was huh? pretty sketchy. <laughs> it was pretty dumb to be in that position. That was all the captain's fault. Yeah. That's yeah. one of those days where you wish you were not the captain. <laughs> <laughs> and you were delivering that boat for someone? Yeah, up to his new house in Seattle, Washington. You used to do you do a lot of that, or you did? I used to do a really? ton of deliveries. Wow. There was probably twelve years there where we did just a massive amount of deliveries wow. for people up and down the coast. Now I, now that I'm older and wiser, I try not to do any of those deliveries above Point Conception. <laughs> you know, unless it's a phenomenal amount of money. Yeah, they leave it to the younger guys. Let them do it. What's the farthest you've gone on a boat? Down to Mazatlan. Oh, no way. Puerto Vallarta, wow. stuff like that. Yeah, that's cool. Cabo every year. We're down in Cabo every year. Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm not like, there's a lot of my buddies that live in Cabo, work in Cabo all the time. I'm down there every year for a couple of weeks. This year we were blessed. We got to go down there for four months. Oh, we were down wow. there October, November, December, January. Wow. Brought the boat home at the end of January. And the fishing was insane. We were catching 30 to 40 marlin every single day after the tournament we were down there for the bisbees and then when that was over we were fishing striped marlin up on the finger bank and it was absolutely insane there were schools of marlin as big as your house every day oh, all over the place it wasn't yeah. one school there was 20 schools so you could spread out there was 10 12 boats up there but everybody would have their own school there was never a time where you had to fish with the other boats yeah and it was insane. Every, every mackerel you threw into the school, you got a bite. And you could literally catch as many marlin as you wanted every day. That's wild. Yeah, and I we, talked to uh, Evan. He okay. Was down, he won, did he win a couple years yeah, ago? Yeah, he won the Bisbee yeah. last year. Yeah, we talked about that. That was really interesting. His story was pretty interesting, too, man. Yeah. Young guy, man. Very young. Yeah. Very, <laughs> yeah. very young. Very fishy kid. Yeah. Very lucky. Yeah. Because, you know, you got talent, but then you got it. There's got to be some luck involved in that yeah. young feller's very lucky man. Yeah. Yeah. He, yep. he talked about winning. That, that's really cool. It's insane. And being able to enter the tournament, too, is like, for all you guys, that's like a, I got got to be a real great experience, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's pretty spectacular. I never got to go on the podium. That kid's been on it twice. <laughs> That's pretty insane. I got some buddies that have been up there a few times, but not me. We just go down there and do our best. And yeah. Hopefully we get the right one, get lucky. But You get a lot of buddies from up here going down there to enter it too, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that Bisbee's is the largest money jackpot tournament in the world, so people yeah. come from all over the world to play. That's wild, man. Yeah, there's a lot of charter boats down there running with a bunch of guys. There's so much money down there. It's insane. Oh, it's insane. <laughs> How long have you been doing it for? I've been going down there for probably 20 years. Wow. Maybe a little longer. Yeah. Maybe a little longer if I look. Yeah. But it's at least 20 years. Wow. I got some good buddies that, that live down there. We all got sober together, and there's some oh, really good cool. AA meetings down there. So yeah. we go every time we're down there. That's cool. The whole thing is we'll go back and delve. We're jumping all over, but I got sober in 1987. Uh-huh. And uh, I was a pretty bad drug addict, alcoholic back in those days. And uh, mainly because of every single person in the industry that was my hero was, and I'm trying, I love all of you guys, but 
It, it was a drugging and drinking world back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, that's what I've heard. All your captains were hardcore fishermen, gnarly fishermen, mm -hmm. but you drank all day. And that's what everyone I looked up to drank. Yeah. And then I'm the younger guy, so there was a lot of drugs, a lot of cocaine, a lot of, a lot of meth, a lot of... A lot of pills, a lot yeah. of stuff, just gnarly in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Yeah. It was gnarly. Yeah. And then 1987, I was just done. I was, I couldn't do it anymore. So uh -huh. I checked myself into a 30-day treatment program. Nice, man. And I bit, only had to get sober once. That's great. And it's been <laughs> that's 30 a long years, run, man. 31 yeah, that's years. Great. Yeah, Something it's pretty amazing. About. It's yeah. allowed me to do my passion for a living because yeah. if I hadn't have got it, I wouldn't be here right now. I promise you that. Yeah. I was on a road to death. Wow. It was pretty gnarly. It was pretty scary. Yeah. You know, it was <laughs> It was a pretty scary time in my life. It was a dark time. It was a dark time, but we thought we were having fun. Yeah. We yeah. really did. We thought we were having fun, but if the and people... And you're a young guy at the time, so it's kind of like... You yeah, know... I was 27 when I got that, sober. That's young still. Yeah. So. If the people knew what they were getting into every day on the boat, I don't think they would have been coming on the boats back in those days. But we made it through. We got sober before the the guy hit the rocks in Alaska, before all the drug testing went into effect and everything. Oh, so I what got happened lucky. with that? I didn't, I didn't know. The Valdez, when it hit the rocks up in wow. Alaska. I, I didn't know anything. You never heard about that? No. Okay, haven't. that happened in the early 1990s and dumped a ton of oil into, the, into Alaska. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when all commercial pilots and all commercial passenger for hire vessels that's when the drug testing thing came into oh, effect it, it, there was no drug testing before no the guy that crashed the boat was he was he uh trashed well he was sleeping oh okay yeah the captain yeah. the captain was sleeping and his third mate was driving the boat oh wow so that and and that's a whole story in itself and you guys can look it up the valdez disaster and i'm not here to t talk about how it happened or anything like that it's just that's when drug testing came into our world okay that's when it came into the pilot's world and the and the is captain's that random world. yeah well all employment in the industry mm -hmm. pre-employment you have to have a drug card, which means you pass your drug test just to get a job in the industry. Okay. You have to. And then then there's random testing. All captains are tested every five years when you renew your license. Mm -hmm. They do a test then. But if you're involved in anybody's business, and I'm talking a four pack, a one pack, a two pack, mm -hmm. are up to the Royal Player size, it's super important that you have all your ducks in a row as far as the drug testing goes with the Coast Guard, that's mm -hmm. the first thing they're going to ask for is your drug, who's who's doing your drug testing. Yeah. It's a big deal nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's a huge deal. We want to, we want people to live. We <laughs> yeah, want everyone to be safe, course. man. It's a big deal. So I got lucky and got sober when I got sober. You know, I was the guy back in the day where we were eating out of the trash cans and holding the wow, sign up and dude. life was a mess and shouldn't be here right now i left the family business a long time ago mm -hmm. you know i i read on the oh he's riding his father's coattails well really you need to talk to my pops because that's got to be kind of kind of no crappy too and you kind of carved your own way you know it's i'm sure it's easy for someone to say something like that when your dad did something oh yeah you know big absolutely yeah and i hear it all the time <laughs> on the hate stuff but it wasn't like that I made a mess of my life and uh, thank God my father didn't condone it and we went our separate ways and it was because of that that I got sober because if he would have just kept propping me up and paying for everything and making sure that Dave was okay, then Dave would be dead. Yeah. It was tough love. Yeah. He let go absolutely and let me go fall on my face and do all the stupid crap yeah, that I, I do, did. Right? Yeah, you had to. Right, because that's the biggest problem is when people enable their children. Yeah. You know, and I'm not going to get on a box and start preaching, but it's hard. Tough love is gnarly mm -hmm. when you have to walk away from your child and let him fail. Yeah. I, mean, I got two boys, 28-year-old yeah. and 25-year-old, and thank God they had didn't have to go through the trials and tribulations that I went through because of the fact that I went through them. And I, yeah, yeah hopefully taught them correctly and they're both very successful in their businesses they don't have nothing to do with fishing no thank fishing God, huh thank God. are they fishermen do they like fishing oh they do they they'll do it with me when they're biting 
when they're biting. When they're they, biting, not when right. I just they to don't go. have time for that <laughs> hanging out. It's like, Dad, is there anything else we can do? <laughs> so we'll we'll bring the guns out on the skiff and we'll go shoot and we bring our skeet launchers and stuff because once you're three miles off the beach, that's totally legal. So you can shoot your guns. I didn't know that. My really? kids have lots of guns. So yeah. we bring all the guns out on the boat and we have skeet launchers on the boat and we shoot skeet. Oh, that's fun. What's really fun is when the uh at the end of Halloween, all the I'm just throwing out all kinds no, of weird no, stuff. No. But all the pumpkins that are left, they yeah. float. Yeah. Pumpkins float. Yeah. So we'll take we'll go buy one of the pumpkin <laughs> patches and we'll load my truck up with all the yeah. old pumpkins. And then we'll take them on my skiff and go out five miles off the beach and we'll throw pumpkins all over the water. Oh, that's fun. And dude. just blow pumpkins away. It's yeah. pretty spectacular. That sounds fun. That's it something is I might want to do. Shoot. It's a blast. Yeah. And then on the big yacht I run, we got shotguns that are just for the boat okay. and the skeet launcher. And, you know, we use those biodegradable. Just, yeah, that's awesome. Those clays. It says biodegradable right on the box. Uh huh. Good for the environment. <laughs> you got to make sure. Yeah, oh, you're going to get more shit. Yeah, you don't want to throw a bunch of you don't want to throw a bunch of pollution in the water. There's plenty of balloons out there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, let's talk about your local tackle shop. Okay, where where do you like to go to? Well, when I'm in, see, because I'm on a different boat every day. So when I'm up in Long Beach, I go to Sam's place, the Island Tackle, mm -hmm. up there in Carson. Yeah, that's he's got everything you could possibly need. Uh -huh. And then Mark Wish. At Pacific Edge, when I'm down in Huntington Harbor, I go see Mark. Mark's okay. my buddy. We go in there. Mark's got pretty much everything you need. Mm -hmm. And then as we slide down the coast, I'll go to Longfin. Yeah, I know all course. the guys there. Yeah, Longfin's really cool for me, and they're my buddies, and we have a good time when I go in there. It usually takes a long time because I see everybody I know. Then we'll uh, jump down the coast. We'll go into Angler Center when we're in Newport. We go to Angler Center because they got a lot of the stuff that I need there. And I love going in there with Jimmy Decker because Jimmy's like the mayor there. And so I get the, the cool brother treatment when I'm in there with Jimmy. And then Dana Point, it's Hogan's Tackle. Yep. It's Breck and, and Stephanie, and they are the best. I mean, if they don't have it, you probably don't need it. Or if you think you need it, they can get it for you. Yeah. And then Sand, then uh, Oceanside, mm -hmm. Ken's, custom reel, okay. Ken's Custom Reels. Kenny's got pretty much anything i need right there mm -hmm. and then fisherman's landing tackle great and then dana landing tackle is pretty spectacular too they got a lot of stuff there but i'm always over with rick at fisherman's landing tackle because he's got it all there too yeah and it's good it's a good atmosphere yeah and yeah to go touch base with everybody and touch their hands and stuff and see what's going on you betcha that's what you got to do right absolutely yeah i agree um where can they find everything like if, they, if someone wanted to reach out to you you know, get on the website, uh, book a charter with you. Where would they go? Go to your saltwaterguide.com. Mm -hmm. And for, like I said, $4 and 99 cents a month, you mm -hmm. can be a member of the website. It's pretty spectacular. I mean, we all have $4 and 99 cents. <laughs> go on there the first time and look and see if there's anything in there that will help you in any way, or just go in there and watch the interviews. The interviews yeah. are insane. And now I'm getting to go do Frank Lepresti here next week. I'm going to do Frank. And, you know, it's just fun to be on there and check out all that stuff. Yoursaltwaterguide.com has pretty much everything from spots. And the new thing, I'm sorry we didn't touch on it. The new thing I'm doing now for you guys is game plans. Okay. Every Friday morning, I give you guys a game plan of what you should do this weekend. Oh, that's if nice. I was going to go with you on your boat uh -huh. and we were going to go out of Long Beach... This is where we would do. Yeah. If we're going to go out of Dana Point, this is what we would do. If we're going to go out of San Diego, this is what we do. If we're going to go to Clemente. So I give you four or five spots at Clemente that I would fish or four or five spots at Catalina, four or five spots up at the Horseshoe, yeah. four or five spots in Orange County, four or five spots in San Diego. And I update them every Friday morning so that it's relevant to what's going on out here. Mm hmm and that's a twenty dollar buy up one time. You buy it once, you get the game plans for the year. Oh, that's nice. And that helps everybody, so they have a plan, so they don't have to go fish for boats. Yeah, right. <laughs> if you get anything out of the podcast, don't fish your boats, guys. Yeah, don't fish for boats. <laughs> Start fishing for fish. It'll change what you catch. There you go. Well, we appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Dave. Uh, again, check them out if you guys uh, can. Uh, seems like a, a cool deal to me, man. So. Uh, 
Go to his Instagram. You have an Instagram page? Yeah, your saltwater guide sixty two. Great. So you could check him out and this will be up and in a couple Facebook, of weeks. Facebook, Dave Hansen. Perfect. All right, Dave, thank you again, man. Thank you very much. No problem. Being here.